years. She's uh, still the same age, but I got older. <laughs> Thank you, Nathan. I don't think so, but it's good to see you again. Our live stream is up. Sergeant, can we start our recordings, please? PC recording is rolling. Cloud recording is up. Good morning and welcome to today's remote New York City Council hearing on the subcommittee on capital budget. At this time, would council staff please turn on their video. Please place electronic devices on vibrate or silent. If you wish to submit testimony, you may do so at testimony at council.nyc.gov. That is testimony at council.nyc.gov. Thank you, Chair. We are ready to begin. Good morning. Um, I am Councilmember Helen Rosenthal, and this is my debut hearing serving as Chair of the Subcommittee on the Capital Budget. I am grateful to the speaker for giving me this opportunity. I'd like to welcome council members Gibson, Adams, and Minority Leader Matteo. Thank you for joining us today. From my time at the Mayor's Office of Management and Budget before I joined the council, as well as my service as chair of the Committee on Contracts during my first term, I've developed a profound appreciation for any mayoralty's uh, execution and in this administration, their efficient execution of the city's capital program. And I've witnessed this council's ability to strengthen transparency and oversight. I was delighted when Speaker Johnson established this committee in 2018 to laser focus our attention on the city's capital budget. And I celebrate the work of my predecessor as chair, Vanessa Gibson, in elaborating on that important vision with hearings over the past three years. Today, we're here to discuss restarting the city's capital program, which came to a screeching halt in the early days of the COVID-19 pandemic. When the market for municipal bonds seized up, largely because of investors fear that the pandemic would put cities at fiscal risk, the administration rightly went into triage mode to conserve our limited capital dollars and prioritize health and safety capital projects. This shutdown affected a wide range of capital activities. For example, contracts that were at the controller's office about to be registered were clawed back. OMB stopped granting most certificates to proceed and early stage design and planning work was largely put on hold. The comedic examples of Charlie Chaplin in the modern times and Lucy and Ethel in I Love Lucy remind us that on factory assembly lines, workers must work together and consistently to avoid creating bottlenecks and fouling the entire production process, let alone the chocolates. Likewise, the capital pipeline consists of dozens of discrete steps to advance projects from vague early stage ideas to permanent public infrastructure. Its success ultimately requires continuous effort across all stages because of limited cap capacity at each step. With the city's bonding capacity now restored, although we can certainly hear more about that, the challenge is how to restart a stalled capital process and address the accumulated backlog of projects that were put on pause or never commenced. This challenge will largely fall to the Department of Design and Construction, which uh, in which in its capacity as the city's expert capital construction project manager is responsible for the design, construction, and coordination of capital projects for city agencies. We are joined today by DDC's first deputy commissioner, Jamie Torres Springer, and chief financial officer, Rachel Lazerin, someone who I happen to know is expert in this field. And I look forward to hearing the department's vision for this Herculean task. 
Before I conclude, I want to thank the staff who helped prepare for this hearing. And in particular, I'd like to thank the finance division and subcommittee staff whose work I've always admired. Nathan Toth, deputy director, Chima o Obicheri, unit head, Monica Bujak, financial analyst, Rebecca Chasen, senior counsel, and Noah Breck, assistant counsel. And of course, from my staff, Madhuri Shukla, my legislative director, Sarah Crean, my communications director, and Cindy Cardinal, my chief of staff. I will now turn it over to our committee counsel to go over some procedural items and swear in the witnesses, and then we will hear testimony from DDC. Thank you. Thank you. I am Noah Brick, counsel to the City Council Subcommittee on Capital Budget. Before we begin, I want to remind everybody that you will be on mute until you are called upon to testify, at which point you will be unmuted by the Zoom host. I will be calling on panelists to testify. Please listen for your name to be called as I will periodically announce who, is ne who the next panelist will be. We will first hear testimony from the administration, which will then be followed by questions from council members and then testimony from members of the public. I will now administer the oath. Um, please raise your right hands. Do you affirm that your testimony will be truthful to the best of your knowledge, information, and belief, Mr. Torres Springer? Yes. Uh, Ms. Lazarin? Yes. And uh, I see we're also joined by Mr. Holowick uh, in case he jumps in. Uh, Mr. Holowick, can you also uh, affirm? Yes. Thank you. Um, uh, before I uh, ask the, the uh, Mr. Torres Springer to uh, start his testimony. I just want to acknowledge that we've been joined by Councilmember Lander. Uh, uh, Mr. Torres Springer, you may begin when ready. Thank you very much. Uh, good morning, Chair and Council Members. Um, before I start with testimony, I, I just wanted to, I did get a message uh, a minute ago that my microphone wasn't working. So uh, can everyone hear me? You're good. Okay, you're not good. We just lost you. <laughs> no problem. That was perfect timing, Chair. I think in like a future video about Zoom hearings, you know, being able to hear them and then not. Um, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, I switched to my backup, which is a little more more of an awkward uh, setup, but should work. Always have a backup. Um, nice. uh, let me just switch. Okay, there we go. So, good morning, uh, Chair Rosenthal and other members of the subcommittee. Um, I do actually, before I start the prepared remarks, I do also want to thank uh, Councilmember Gibson for uh, her work as chair of this subcommittee. Um, it's been really productive for us over the last few years to engage with this subcommittee, both in hearings and also offline in the many meetings uh, that we've had about uh, the preparation and implementation of DDC's strategic blueprint for construction excellence, which has led to um, uh, the last year aside, which we'll talk about significant improvements in how we deliver on capital projects. So I really want to thank uh, Council Member Gibson for for uh, for working with us on that. Um, so uh, as as you mentioned, I'm Jamie Torres Springer. Uh, I'm first deputy commissioner of the Department of Design and Construction. I'm happy to appear before you today to discuss the impacts of the COVID-19 pandemic on DDC's capital program. And I'm joined by Rachel Lazerin, our chief financial officer. Uh, Rachel joined us uh, fairly recently uh, and, uh, and has been uh, making a, a huge difference for us um, based on, uh, as you say, uh, years of experience across city government, uh, including previously at DDC, which has been a huge advantage for us. I want to begin my testimony on this subject by describing DDC's role in the city's capital construction process. Uh, we're the city's design and construction manager for much of its capital portfolio. We collaborate with more than 20 sponsor agencies 
and the Office of Management and Budget to help ensure the constructability and the scope of projects presented to us initially through our front end planning unit. Once a sponsor agency project is approved to move forward, we then use the budget allocation and proceed with design and construction while working to ensure this is done as efficiently and cost effectively as possible. To give you the sense of a, the scope of our overall portfolio, the total value of active projects at the moment is a little bit in excess of $22 billion across nearly 700 active projects. The pandemic has been a challenging time for DDC as it has for the city as a whole. Um, there also have been some positive impacts, which I will explain. But first, I'd like to take the opportunity to publicly thank the DDC staff who have continued to work through very difficult conditions to keep our projects on track and who have played an outsized role in creating the field hospitals, testing and vaccination sites and other facilities the city needs for an effective pandemic response. I've personally witnessed the dedication and tireless effort of these, thank you, these frontline professionals, and they deserve a tremendous amount of credit. Um, so starting with the, the early pandemic, um, as you're aware, on March 7th of last year, the governor issued Executive Order 202 declaring a disaster emergency throughout the state because of COVID-19. The governor's order led to an executive order by the mayor enforcing the state's mandate at the local level. DDC then worked with our partner agencies to determine the best way to proceed in the earliest and darkest days of the pandemic in a manner that would protect our employees, our contractors and vendors, and the general public while still carrying out our duty to the public at the highest level possible. The agency's infrastructure construction projects, which by their nature affect the critical delivery of drinking water, as well as the proper functioning of the sewer and the surface transportation systems, continued without significant delay. Periodically, projects were paused when there were health issues uh, on the work site for a quarantine period, but then restarted safely. Within days of the declaration, most of our public buildings portfolio in construction, with the exception of a handful of projects, really just about seven uh, that were essential to life safety were paused. Our division of site and safety support worked closely with our infrastructure division and our public buildings division during this time to develop protocols, checklists, and educational materials that would allow projects to continue with the smallest amount of risk. Subsequently, consultant design work paused as much of the city locked down and the impacts of the crisis widened. Exceptions were made for critical programs such as the Eastside Coastal Resiliency Project, for projects with outside deadlines such as for a consent decree or where there was significant federal or state funding that was on a a clock or a deadline, and for a small number of projects that were deemed critical by the Department of Environmental Protection for the performance of the water and sewer systems. So there, just to be clear, I'm talking about the projects that we had in design that were not yet in construction, but were in design. And then getting to the period of restarting our work, last June, DDC began restarting the public buildings construction projects, construction projects in consultation with OMB and our sponsor agencies. We have since returned all projects to construction. And over the last several months, we have gradually restarted the most, uh, most design consultant contracts for both public buildings and infrastructure projects, again, in consultation with our partner or sponsor agencies. We expect to resume all outstanding work over the next few months, although I must note that this timeline is subject to change based on the city's cash flow needs. We also remain ready to assist OMB and our sponsor agencies in navigating their future capital plan prioritizations. Um, looking ahead, uh, we're looking forward to outlining our capital plan at our upcoming hearing on the preliminary budget. Uh, in short, the preliminary budget reflects continued strong investment in both our infrastructure and public buildings divisions. But again, we must qualify that um, those investments are subject to change based on the city's budget needs. Um, I just want to spend a minute on our work during the pandemic, for which we're extremely proud. Um, though DDC was impacted by the pandemic, staff were responsible for truly heroic work. Working closely with New York City Emergency Management, the Health and Hospitals Corporation, 
the Department of Health and Mental Hygiene, and many, many others, uh, we built the facilities the city has relied on to manage the pandemic. Briefly, since the pandemic began, the agency has designed and built two field hospitals with 1,100 patient beds, including uh, a number of beds for those in intensive care. We've designed and built 28 COVID testing sites across the city, with many that include space for on-site contact tracing. We've procured for health and hospitals eight mobile testing trucks, which are weatherproof and able to be deployed at COVID hotspots outdoors in the winter. We've expanded four health department laboratories and upgraded them with negative air pressure handling. That's how much of the uh, rapid PCR testing results uh, in the city are being produced. And finally, we have substantially com completed from start to finish three large COVID centers of excellence, uh, which are uh, post-COVID ambulatory care facilities that health and hospitals will operate as community clinics, specially designed to manage the long-term healthcare needs of New Yorkers recovering from COVID. And these have been built in neighborhoods that have been deeply impacted by the pandemic, uh, including Morrisania, Bushwick, um, and, uh, and Elmhurst. Uh, so we're very, we're very proud of that, that uh, set of projects. We're also now deeply engaged in creating vaccination centers uh, and the vaccination rollout effort in general. Uh, we recently completed the large vaccination sites at Yankee Stadium and at the Empire Outlets on the North Shore of Staten Island. And we're in the midst of uh, preparing to create a number of additional vaccination expansion sites in Staten Island, Manhattan and the Bronx, while our colleagues at the School Construction Authority manage a number of uh, site build outs in Brooklyn and Queens. This has been a remarkable effort by DDC staff, and it has placed them on the front lines of the pandemic with much of the risk and urgency experienced by other frontline personnel, and we're very proud of them. The COVID work I have described was performed under procurement rules allowed by the state's and city's emergency declarations, and the fact that we were able to deliver hundreds of millions of dollars of construction from start to finish in mere months shows what the agency is capable of when working outside the typical constrained procurement, administrative, and oversight regime. What's more, the work was emblematic of the foundational goals of DDC's Blueprint for Construction Excellence, uh, efficiency, process improvement, and quality project delivery. Our COVID work is ongoing, uh, but we are already reviewing these successes and will make future recommendations for how to improve the capital construction processes based on our experiences since March. That will likely include changes to Local Law 63, which currently requires a 60-day waiting period before any type of consultant contracts can be advertised to even begin the procurement process. It's worth noting that many of our infrastructure projects, which remained in construction throughout the pandemic, also saw remarkable progress and were able to be finished well ahead of schedule. We attribute this to decreased vehicle and pedestrian traffic, which allowed our staff and contractors to get more generous work permits and work much more quickly in the field. Indeed, I was there in June when we celebrated with the Department of Transportation the completion of phase two of the rebuilding of Atlantic Avenue in Brooklyn, a $48 million project that finished six months ahead of schedule and has brought traffic calming and many other safety enhancements to uh, over a, a mile long stretch of this very busy thoroughfare. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to testify today. Um, Rachel and I are happy to answer any questions that you and your colleagues may have. Well, thank you so much. First, I'd like to acknowledge that we've been joined by council member Gridencheck. Welcome. Um, I, I actually wanna start by something with something that you just mentioned in your testimony that um, the two you have a you have a lead in that was just terrific where you talked about during COVID uh, and with the state of emergency there were many things that were lifted so you were able to move more quickly and I'm really interested in understanding what those things were. Um, in your testimony, you mentioned Local Law 63 and traffic, both of which are, I get, um, but neither of which are state, I mean, I guess Local Law 63, but, you know, I, I'm really interested in learning what those state um, or city regulations were 
Um, even if you could just mention a couple and, and we, well, I guess this is public testimony, but we won't hold you to it. Oh, yeah. I, thank you very much, Chair. I mean, this is our, this is, uh, although we um, clearly have been struggling uh, like, like everyone else throughout the pandemic, I mean, this is one of the, this remains one of the most important things uh, for our agenda and uh, something that we would, we would prefer to talk about more than anything else, which is how we can uh, sort of, uh, uh, as, as, uh, as one of my colleagues likes to say, uh, remove the handcuffs from DDC so that we can deliver more effectively. So I would summarize um, what we've been able to do with emergency work during the pandemic and basically in three categories. The first is alternative modes of delivery. So um, we were not consigned to using the conventional design bid build uh, process, which is has been historically the only way that DDC can deliver uh, because of the low bid requirement in general municipal law 103. And we have received authorization from the state legislature to use design build, but in a fairly constrained way. And so in the pandemic, we were able on an emergency basis to hire a construction manager um, and uh, bring that construction manager together with a design team as an integrated project delivery team and have them design and build the project. Um, we're able to maintain all of the constraints, um, get all the paperwork done. Um, they you know, competitively bid uh, much of the construction work um, wherever possible. Uh, and, and yet we're able to, you know, in the case of those uh, centers of excellence, um, projects that would have taken four or five years, we got them built, $120 million worth of capital work. We got them built in less than nine months. Um, so, uh, you know, that, that's, uh, you know, very significant, um, probably, you know, the most significant thing is just giving us alternative modes of delivery. The second thing um, is streamlining the notice and hearings process. And that's an example of where Local Law 63 um, does add months to procurement, where effectively we need to, uh, to advertise uh, 60 days before we advertise. Um, and if we haven't done that, we have to just stop and wait. Um, and so, you know, I think Local Law 63 is well-founded legislation by the council, but there are uh, surgical improvements that could be made to make it easier for us. Um, the third is emergency oversight, um, in which uh, we're able to register contracts immediately because there was streamlined oversight at OMB, and we're not required to go through the standard comptroller reviews, which also typically add months to our procurements. Uh, and so the... Um, the role of various oversights, including the controller in uh, the registering uh, DDC contracts is, is something that certainly, uh, you know, we would recommend taking a hard look at after this. Wow, you answered more than I thought you would. So thank you for that. We were ready with that one. Yeah, I, I'm <laughs> taking notes, trying to keep up with you. Um, it's very, very helpful. Um, Are the changes to the controller's review written into, are, are the controller's review uh, process written into the charter or is that more rulemaking within the office of the controller? Um, I might defer some of that to the mayor's office of contract services and the law department. I mean, I, I would say in general that, um, there is a step, contract registration, um, which does go to the controller. Um, and within the charter, uh, it's, it's narrowly defined as uh, basically checking if uh, a project has, if funds have been appropriated and checking to make sure that we've done the appropriate reviews of the vendor. And that you know, has often um, become a, a, you know, a, a more significant and lengthy review. Um, which, uh, you know, and the, and the preparation for that more significant and lengthy review has, uh, has slowed us down quite a bit. Mm -hmm. And is there a way, um, just sort of thinking about this hearing, this proposed hearing topic, which we're, this is now turned into, um, I'm wondering if there's, would you be able to do perhaps with the mayor's office of contracts sort of a side by side of what changes were made with the controller's review over that period of time 
and or whether or not changes were made during that review. In other words, you know, if we made it a shorter review period, what would the impact be on outcomes? Would you be able to do that kind of analysis? Sure, yeah, we'd be happy to, to give you something on that. Great. Okay, um, let me ask you, uh, what, oh, could you just mention a few of the projects that DDC was able to continue during the pause and the OMB slowdown, like, like immense kudos for all the work you did with the vaccine sites, the test and trace, the hospitals, like amazing. But were there any projects that had been going prior to the pause that continued? And how, how did that go in terms of, you know, uh, now being under the emergency procurement rules? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm happy to. Uh, so uh, as I was mentioning, our infrastructure portfolio, which is basically roads, water, and sewer, um, which is about 60% of DDC's capital portfolio, that was able to continue. It was essential work under the governor's and the mayor's executive orders. It also, um, those sites are outdoors, so it was, um, um, you know, rel relatively straightforward to maintain social distance and appropriate health and safety controls. Um, so all of those projects continued. And as I mentioned, many of them uh, were accelerated. Um, uh, and we, I think I mentioned in the testimony, we, we opened a significant improvement to Atlantic Avenue. We completed a number of different um, street and sewer and water reconstruction projects over the last year. Um, the public buildings uh, side of the portfolio has had been uh, shut down. Um, you know, again, not not covered except for uh, the essential life safety projects. Um, not covered in the executive order. Generally indoors, harder to maintain social distance. Um, so we were uh, able to bring those back online safely uh, in June. Um, we um, we did have uh, a tremendous effort by our site safety group. Uh, to make sure that we put all new protocols in place, um, you know, mask wearing uh, primary among them. I do sort of personally spend a lot of time in the uh, late spring and during the summer driving around to sites where mask wearing hadn't become sort of uh, culturally accepted within the construction industry yet. And, and, um, and we did uh, uh, take a very hard line on that. So um, there were a number of cases that uh, emerged on our construction sites and we would shut down that site uh, quarantine the people who had been uh, closely linked to each other uh, and then bring it back. But um, the cases actually really were kept to quite a minimum. Um, and then uh, I, I think I was mentioning that uh, most of our um, design that is uh, consultant based uh, because of cash flow concerns, budget concerns was paused. Um, and uh, we did keep uh, the East Side Coastal Resiliency Project going. Um, we started that project um, uh, in November, uh, in the field in the northern section, we've just received bids for the southern section of the project. Mm -hmm. um, we did pause our borough-based jails program uh, for a number of months, and we revised the schedule uh, as a result of that, but it is now going, and we expect to uh, register significant work uh, on all four of the borough-based jail sites before the end of this year. Um, oh, wow. And, and then a lot of other projects have, have been restarted and have kept going, which I, I could go on and on about, but that, that's some of the highlights. May I ask, would it be in the control? I wanna ask about the borough-based jails. This is totally off message and I promise my last question will be back to being on message, but does the controller, could the controller slow down registration of those borough-based jail contracts? Well, um, we, uh, so I, I, I'll just say that the borough-based jails are, um, we are using the design build authorization for those okay. projects. Um, it's great. We, I, I would love a chance to talk more about our design build program today as well. Um, uh, the, we, um, we are moving through getting uh, contracts ready to be awarded and registered. Um, we've had a very good dialogue and cooperative relationship with the controller's office, just sort of all of us recognizing that design build was coming and it required a change in the way that we uh, need to approach uh, the whole contract process. Um, so we're, we're very hopeful that things go smoothly. 
Great, great to hear. Um, I would, I was really proud to vote uh, in support of the borough-based jails, uh, and also very proud to vote for the renewable Rikers plan. And so, really want to make sure that that um, building happens quickly. Um, and if there's anything this committee can do to help, uh, we stand ready. My last question is, um, and, and you're starting to answer that question, but what are the largest barriers to DDC's immediate progress in ramping up to full capacity? Um, are there projects that went out to bid but are waiting to be registered where uh, DDC would now need to refresh or reopen stale bids? Um, you know, uh, honest, I mean, if you can speak to, um, you know, OMBs, uh, um, whether or not they're lifting, you know, the chokehold, rightly so what they did on um, moving CPs through the process. So, so what are the largest barriers now to yeah. ramp up to full capacity? Yeah, I mean, I guess I'd start by saying that I, I think in, in many ways we're well positioned for the restart. As I said, we, construction has been restarted for some time. Um, most, uh, all of our in-house design, which is primarily how we do the infrastructure design, uh, that's, that's in-house, that's been going. Um, and we've uh, gradually been restarting our public buildings, our external design projects, um, and hope to restart 100% uh, of them over the coming months. Um, we did have projects that were uh, bid and were put on hold uh, for, uh, as you say, for the CP issuance and the registration. Uh, but so far, no vendors have withdrawn their previously open bids, uh, which is great. Um, there's still a lot of interest in working with DDC and the city. Um, and so um, so we're we're pretty confident. I mean, I, I would just say, you, you know, sort of to, to your point, um, council member, the you know, the economic crisis that was brought about by COVID-19 is, is far from over and it's forced the city to make some difficult decisions with respect to spending. Um, so, uh, you know, at the moment, all projects that uh, have been paused are planned to restart over the next few months. But, yeah. um, you know, I say on behalf of the, the administration as a whole that this is really subject to change based on the city's cash flow needs. And, you know, we are we remain in a dire uh, budget situation and that that's really what could have the biggest impact. Yeah, makes sense, makes sense. Do you have a list of priorities where you could sort of say, here's our list, top 10, next 20, whatever? Yeah, I, so I think as I was saying in the testimony, I mean, we in, in a sense are the, the delivery agency. Um, I under, My understanding is that uh, it, the sponsor agencies have made priority lists and have sent those in uh, to OMB and they've been analyzing them. Um, we know that, you know, as I was saying, there's a certain set of criteria, uh, life safety, uh, is there a consent decree? Um, is there federal or state funding that's at risk and that's on a, a deadline? Um, you know, is it, is it uh, essential work in some way? Those are certainly where the priorities lie. And then beyond that, there's a set of, there's a prioritization uh, by the sponsor agencies and at some point uh, we'll be told what the priorities are and we'll design and build them. I think you just answered my follow-up question. Do you play a role in deciding? Are there meetings with the agency heads, your office, OMB, contracts together to decide or is that really in OMB's house? There's a lot of dialogue um, we have, uh, over the last few years, created a, just a fabulous front end planning group um, and really empowered that group. It was kind of something that was missing from the city as a whole. I mean, we have obviously we have the Department of City Planning. They have a capital planning group that's focused on sort of the inputs of capital planning. I mean, you know, where should we build and what are the pocket demographics and so on. And what we were missing was kind of something focusing on the outputs, which is is a project constructible? Is it, um, you know, how, how, uh, how much of a priority is it sort of physically in terms of the city's infrastructure that we get a project going? And we have that capacity at the front end planning group. So they're very engaged in 
the discussions that take place between the sponsor agencies and OMB as priorities are set. You know, as uh, that is awesome. And let's sort of put a pin in that discussion because for sure that'll be the topic of a, another um, hearing as the speaker has put out a plan to talk about these issues of coordination between the agencies and community yep. input, et cetera. So I'll look forward to that hearing and it sounds like you've made some headway, which is really terrific. All right, thank you. I'm gonna turn it back now to the committee council. Thank you, Noah. Uh, thank you. Um, I will now call on council members to ask questions in the order in which they have used the Zoom raise hand function. Uh, if you'd like to ask questions, please raise your hand. Uh, we will now hear from Council Member Lander. Uh, thank you very much, Chair. Thank you for convening this hearing and congrats on being the, the chair of this uh, committee. Um, and thanks for your work and pushing on these issues in the past and now. Um, uh, and Deputy Commissioner, it's great to see you. Um, you know, I want to say thank you to you, but on behalf of your whole agency for the quite remarkable work DDC has done in response to COVID. I've had the chance to see some of those testing sites that you guys put up. I haven't been to the big vaccination sites yet, but I'm excited to see those as, as well. And it is uh, impressive and we're grateful. And I also want to thank you for the work you've been doing through your strategic planning process to transform DDC, you know, I think before you and Commissioner Grillo got there, um, you know, there were, we, I did not feel, I think the council broadly did not feel, but I certainly did not feel that the agency was really taking seriously the need for significant transformation of our capital projects management system. And there's a long way to go, certainly, but, but there's no doubt that you are taking it seriously, building a team that has made a lot of progress. And I also want to appreciate your answer to Chair Rosenthal's question about what some of those next steps look like and how the council and other partners, um, including the controller's office can be a valuable part of helping really accelerate. You know, I think we're entering a moment when we need to jumpstart our economy, when we need a bold recovery, when getting projects going now so they employ people and create jobs, even as they're building a platform for a more sustainable uh, and thriving future is just really critical. So I'm glad you've done that work. We absolutely wanna be your partner in pushing forward on it. Um, I do want to ask some questions about the pausing and unpausing, because I do have to be honest, and I, I think more of my frustration sits in the in the nexus that you were just describing with Council Member, with Chair Rosenthal about OMB, but I found it very difficult to understand why some decisions got made about what was paused when and why, and what was unpaused when and why, and I, I had some public disagreements with the, with OMB, you know, because I think they simply said there were some things that were straightforward, obviously, during the period when all construction was shut down, things were shut down, safety comes first. Um, but then cash flow got used to cover over everything. Like I did not feel like meaningful public information was provided to get clear how much cash flow there was for capital projects, why things were unpaused when they were, whose decision it was, and how the council, much less the public, could know any of it. So I just wanna start with one project in particular before I ask about the general questions. And you might not know about it, so if you wanna pick a different project, you can, but it's the one that I was familiar with is on 4th Avenue, we have a major DOT project, you know, the, that was restriped to create bike lanes and pedestrian safety. But a project, I don't remember the number, it's like between 50 and $100 million. So pretty sizable project, not, um, life-saving urgency. It's not an emergency project, but it is a road safety project. And I understood you to say that those were in this top priority. But, it, you know, from my conversations with the contractor, and in that case, it had already been designed, it had been bid, a contractor who I think happened to be an MWBE was standing by to hire people and get going and got no information on when the project was restarted. It was paused for months, well past the summer pause. I could not get information on when it, you know, what was going on with it. And I, I guess I'm asking a couple of questions because I don't really understand what happened with that project, when and how and why those decisions got made and how I or any members of the public or even the contractor themselves could have gotten the relevant information. Sure. Um, <clears throat> I mean, I, I'm happy to, uh, 
come back with some more details on on that one, Council Member. Um, I, I guess I, my my understanding of of, um, of that issue, I mean, it is sort of a project that was sitting in between, right? It, as I was mentioning, a project that was in active construction was restarted in June um, for a project that was um, designed but not fully registered and ready to start. Um, there are a number of other contractual components that have to be met. One is that we need a uh, separate uh, engineering firm to serve as the project oversight. Um, and I should confirm this, but I believe that, that it was an issue with getting that, uh, what's called an REI, uh, resident engineer inspector, uh, getting that firm in place um, through the, you know, the pause. Um, and uh, to, to your last point, we, we have a, an intergovernmental uh, relations group um, and uh, you know, we, we also uh, engage with the contractors very directly. So I'm, I'm not actually sure exactly, I, I, don't, I don't recall exactly who that contractor is, but they certainly should know to call us and get an update. And we would really encourage you in your office to uh, to give us a call if you need an update on, on the status of a project, as I know you do. Um, and and I, I didn't mean that you were non-responsive. I, I reached out to your agency and you gave me some information about the project so and and of course i think the contractor knew they weren't able to begin it's it's helpful to understand i just think i was as clear when you say unpaused you meant projects that were already in construction had been paused in construction and were unpaused in construction and projects that were at other points in our capital uh projects system yes. uh, i wasn't thinking of this one as in design because it was post design it had been bid a bid had been awarded but it's true construction had not started and it sounds like that all that set of projects that were shy of construction starting, um, you know, were are just in individual project specific states of how they were able and when they were able to be picked picked up. But I guess this goes to my question about. Go ahead, sorry, uh, Council Member. I would just also say, I mean, I I would defer some of the budget um, questions to OMB, but I I would say on their behalf, I mean, there was a moment where, you know. Uh, authorizing any additional spending was just not possible based on the, you know, the capital market situation that the city was in. So it just as uh, difficult as it, as it was, just any new spending obligations was just not something that the city could do. Otherwise, we wouldn't be able to finance the projects. So, so I hear that, but I, I have two problems with it. And I, I guess I'm just going to put them out there and ask you to respond to them because I feel like two things overlapped here. One is no meaningful information was given to the council or to the public to evaluate that what you, I don't, it's not that I don't believe it, but no, we didn't get any information. And then I really do believe OMB held on to that argument long after it was true. I 100% agree with you. There was a period of time when a dire cash flow crunch, when the tax collections were delayed for a quarter, we did not have the money. And like there really was a cash flow issue in which you want to pay people their payroll and look it's the same bank account that's paying the payroll and paying the debt on the bonds and so you know that is that was real i believe that it was real for a fairly brief period of time and that omb in their job of trying to slow things down and have us spend less money and act as you know for fiscal prudence then slow walked capital projects far beyond what was necessary for cash flow purposes using that argument and I guess my frustration is the council nor the public got information really on either side, like either meaningfully on cash flow position, but also on like you've described a productive dialogue between you, the authorizing agencies and OMB, but the council has no visibility into that process whatsoever. And we can call and ask about an individual project, but if our questions are about the system, don't we want to be restarting more projects? Don't we need to be diving in more aggressively to get them going? So we're creating jobs and priming our economy and moving forward. Uh, what should I have been using to evaluate whether the city's getting it right? Yeah, I, I think I would really have to defer that question to OMB, council member. Okay. Um, so Thanks I'll, remember, I'll I'm going to ask you to start to round up, wrap up, but of Thank course, you. I'll just ask one final question. Yeah. And then, um, uh, which is sort of related to this, cause I, I appreciate that this is an OMB question. It's just, uh, if, if, if our, you know, you've persuaded me that for those things that were already in construction, they're now moving forward. I still think we are moving too slowly 
on capital projects, throughput of projects in the system. And I don't fully understand why. And I think it's a mistake for the city's economic recovery. And I want us to move faster. And some of that are the reforms you laid out. But some of them, are, I think, the reforms I'm asking for. So we'll ask OMB. I guess just to that final point, then my last question is, for evaluating that question, what is, you know, what's lost by delays? Um, how do you think about that? You know, obviously, some of it we just had to do, but we do, things wind up costing more, we lose jobs by not creating them, even if they're going to happen in the future, like that's a reduction of our overall capital plan, because things get pushed off into the future. I mean, I know it's your job just to manage the projects and move them forward as quickly as you can, but do you or does someone provide some evaluation of what the consequences are of delays as we think about how to push things forward and, and evaluate? Um, I, I would, I guess I would sort of give an, a narrow answer from our perspective, which is we certainly do look at and keep track of um, time delays on, on projects, which is clearly, you know, important. And we, we are going to see time, you know, I don't, I don't want to, we haven't sort of said it explicitly, but we are going to see delays in project completions uh, as a result of this pause. Um, and that does have, at least for our um, portfolio, uh, sometimes will have impacts in terms of escalation. Um, we haven't seen that yet from uh, contractors, uh, which is good. Um, but uh, and then, of course, uh, pausing and then restarting has costs in terms of mobilization, remobilization costs. So those are the things that we keep track of as an agency. All right. I thank you for that. This is not the hearing on the capital projects tracker, but I know we'll be having a hearing on some uh, adjustments to that shortly. And at that hearing, I'll look forward to asking about how, which obviously that relates to some of what you've just said. And I'll look forward yeah, to having the conversation sure. yeah. next time. Happy to be working uh, thank with you me. very much, uh, Deputy Commissioner. And thank you, especially Madam Chair, for convening this hearing. Terrific. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, are there any other? I'm turning it back to you, uh, Noah Brick. My apologies. Um, I see that uh, Councilmember Grudentrick has his hand raised uh, if he'd like to ask some questions now. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. And it's certainly good to see you here. We'll miss Miss Gibson, but I see she's around. So um, just the last question that uh, the last comment by Councilman Lander, um, I have nothing but respect for uh, Ms. Grillo, uh, your, your commissioner, I know her for a generation. I won't say how old we are, but, uh, but I'll leave it at that. Um, since she's taken over, and I know she, you, the, the whole team there has taken steps, ha has, this is a, a little bit akin to what we're talking about today, um, the number of steps that need to be taken for a capital project in the city of New York to move from, um, from thought to completion are um, to be generous, bewildering, um, to be ungenerous, insane. Um, and I'm wondering if you could enlighten us on some of the, I know that this has not been an easy time for you, uh, for our city, but I'm just wondering if there has been um, some success in that. Yeah, council member, thank you for uh, giving us the opportunity to, to address that. So as you know, we created a strategic plan for trying to address some of those issues. And, and we really did, and we, we've um, spent some time with uh, Council Member Gibson and the committee talking about this in the past. We really did break down every step of the process into its component parts and say, you know, what is taking too long that could be relieved or, you know, really important in this type of work, what can be done at the same time so that one thing isn't holding something else up. And uh, as a result of that, I will say that before the pandemic, um, we had already seen a six month improvement in the average time to deliver a project, which um, it, you know, in the very short term that we had been looking at, which was only a couple of years, that was really impressive. And that was really about, to your point, um, we were able to reduce the time it takes to initiate a project, meaning from the time that the budget is appropriated and the project comes to DDC until the time that we start designing it, we were able to reduce that time uh, from a year to uh, about uh, eight months uh, already. And that was through a number of different process improvements, which I think are, are some of the more frustrating components of the, of the process for the council as well so that we use our front end planning unit to be much more clear up front. And then the other component 
is through streamlining procurement, we had saved an additional three months. Um, you know, the pandemic will obviously have impacts on overall timeframes, but we've put a number of other measures into place to reduce the time it takes to design a project and to build a project, which is where the real time savings can be found. Um, so, so we're uh, definitely excited to keep working on all of that. Thank you. Um, I figured it was an opportunity to talk about it just for a few minutes, and I want to thank the chair for indulging me. And with that, um, Madam Chair, I will relinquish back to you. Uh, Chair Rosenthal, it looks like uh, Council Member Gibson now has her hand raised. If uh, we can recognize her, please. So good to see you. Welcome back, Chair. Go get him. <laughs> but you have to unmute. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Good morning, Madam Chair. And thank you so much to everyone for joining us today. Uh, I want to congratulate Chair Rosenthal on becoming the new chair of the Subcommittee on Capital. Uh, you are in good hands under your leadership, and I look forward to remaining a member of the committee and really talking about a lot of the great things that we've started working with uh, DDC and OMB and the mayor's office uh, and really recognizing that, you know, COVID-19 has been a real setback for us all across the, the city uh, in so many ways and on so many levels. So I appreciate the work that DDC has done, uh, President Grillo. I've talked to her many, many times during the pandemic because I know while we were on pause, we really didn't have the ability to do much of anything. And when the pause was lifted, uh, we can essentially restart a lot of our capital. So I just have two very quick questions just about prioritizing some of the capital projects that were already in queue uh, that were halted because of the uh, moratorium that was in place. And it's one project, and I know Deputy Commissioner, you are very familiar with that I have to bring up again, uh, since it, it falls within my borough of the Bronx, the Bronx Children's Museum. We've been working on this for several years now, uh, my entire time in the council, and we were on track to officially open in 2020. And now with the pandemic, that's been, of course, delayed. So I wonder the challenges that you talked about with your existing capital and cash flow, how can we be assured and what steps is DDC going to take to prioritize some of these projects that are, are really, you know, in terms of delayed, uh, been around for a little while? Would, would it be safe to say that this project, as one example, would be prioritized um, just because there was so many other projects that I know that you have in your portfolio, as well as new projects, right? We know that you're getting new projects each year. Um, so what, what can you say to us that would help us understand how you're prioritizing some of the outstanding capital projects in your portfolio? Sure. Uh, thanks, Council Member. And, and um, we certainly uh, know the importance of that project to you and, and uh, know that you, you, uh, you do, uh, it, it, it should be said very publicly, you do stay, stay on top of us uh, on, on that project. <laughs> Um, and so, so that's a project that's actively in construction. Uh, it was, as I mentioned, paused due to the executive order in the spring um, for a number of months. Uh, it's now restarted. Uh, I don't have a new uh, completion date handy. We can get back to you on that. But I do know that it's progressing towards substantial completion um, despite some delay. And um, it's, it's certainly, a, you know, everything in active construction is a priority. We work by... Uh, contracting with uh, the, you know, the, the builder community, uh, put all the pieces in place, and then they, they go to work and they, they are highly incentivized to uh, build as quickly as they can, despite what often comes up, which is, you know, complexities and problems. Um, so, you know, th there's no uh, issue or constraint in terms of prioritizing that project for completion. Okay, and then my other question is, you know, working with a lot of our vendors and understanding that everyone is hurting, right? Uh, we realize that a lot of these projects, you know, uh, Chair Rosenthal, Councilmember Lander, Councilmember Grudenchik, we all talk about the impact that upstarting and restarting these capital projects brings on the economy, the jobs that are impacted, the vendors that you hire that then in turn hire subcontractors and the impact that it has in creating jobs. I mean, I've been talking a lot about it during the pandemic that we have to get people back to work because recognizing so many folks have lost income, lost revenue, fallen behind in mortgage and rent payments. I mean, we've all struggled to survive. So I wonder 
how is DDC able to help now that we're restarting capital projects? How are you able to help any potential vendors that you work with uh, that may have a cash flow issue, right? And it's just because they haven't been paid. Uh, you know, there's a delay in, you know, contract payments. Are you able to offer any assistance at a vendor level? Um, I mean, thank you for raising that because it certainly, is, you know, we know how important we are to the, the construction industry in the city and it was painful for us to have to pause the project to uh, be dealing with the vendors uh, day in and day out who are struggling, particularly the small ones. And, you know, it must be said, the minority women business enterprises, um, you know, for which we've made so much progress. And I, I do want to say that uh, this has been one of Commissioner Grillo's great priorities as, uh, as the leader of this agency uh, was to increase our MWBE participation. So it was very difficult um, for us. Um, uh, I, a couple of things I've mentioned. One is, as I mentioned earlier, we've done an enormous amount of pandemic related emergency construction work, and that has been an opportunity to get work to vendors. We're very proud of the participation that we've achieved for MWBEs. Um, for just as one example, um, the $120 million uh, center of excellence, the ambulatory uh, post COVID facilities that we built for H&H &H in just uh, six to nine months, um, we achieved a 46% MWB participation rate. Um, we were able to do that because many of the constraints that make it uh, difficult for us to uh, figure out how to contract for projects quickly that I've described earlier uh, were lifted. And so we were able to really push our MWBE goals. Um, uh, you know, the other thing that we've worked on over the last couple of years is just getting payments out quickly. And uh, we're very pleased with our uh, payment processing time. It, it is under 30 days. Um, once we receive a completed payment package, uh, we've established a group um, uh, that reports to Rachel, our CFO, um, that works on prioritizing payments. Um, and we always try to make sure that the vendors are you know, uh, know how to contact us and, uh, you know, call us if there's a payment that's, uh, that's problematic and we work on facilitating it as quickly as we can. Okay. Um, sorry, Chair Rosenthal, just two very quick final questions. Um, you know that, you know, we all are very concerned individually as council members about our discretionary capital. Uh, some of us are leaving at the 1201 on December 31st, <laughs> but who's counting? Um, but we want to make sure that at least a lot of our projects are started. And, you know, it, it's just been really frustrating because I realize a lot of projects that, you know, we allocated in, you know, previous uh, fiscal years, FY20, FY21, while many of them may have started in design, everything has been halted. So we know that there will be delays. Um, so I'm wondering, um, since that time, since the pandemic has hit, has there been any changes in terms of staff? to the unit that handles uh, capital discretionary uh, in terms of a uh, more manpower, more you know, staff that will help expedite these projects. And then the, the second part of the conversation uh, just really relates to the blueprint. Uh, a year after you first announced the blueprint, uh, we had like a one year look back in terms of the success and what has happened. Uh, should we be expecting any amendments to that blueprint in light of COVID-19? Uh, in terms of any new strategies you may develop with the front end planning unit or anything like that that we should expect uh, this year? Um, I might, uh, in a moment, I might ask uh, Rachel, our CFO, to respond about the discretionary projects. Okay. Uh, uh, but the, the answer to your question is, you know, I, I think as I've mentioned a couple of times, that plan of ours, um, in a way, you know, becomes even more salient and important, um, the many things that are in that plan. And we can see evidence that some of the reforms um, around streamlining, um, you know, hearings and public notices, uh, alternative modes of project delivery, um, streamlining oversight and registration, that's really what's at the core of that strategic plan, that those things have all been proven to be very effective during the pandemic. So uh, I, we're certainly, um, you know, we intend to keep it updated, keep tracking our progress. Uh, and also engage with this committee and with the council as a whole on some of these uh, improvements that we can make. Um, Rachel, did you want to say something about the discretionary program? Sure. Um, yeah, I appreciate the question. It's um, we understand how important these uh, projects are um, to you know to the council and to the community. And um, just as Jamie mentioned before, those projects were paused um, for some period of time. 
Um, they have been unpaused and we are working through them. We're working with OMP, um, with the nonprofit um, and council finance um, to, to get all those projects back on track. And of course, if you have questions about specific projects, we're always happy to follow up afterwards. Okay, great. Thank you. I appreciate it. And I hope that, you know, DDC considers some of these projects that we're talking about in terms of capital discretionary are very small. They're not multi-million dollar capital projects. They're $100,000 for a mobile unit, right? Which, you know, proves very beneficial right now since we're not doing indoor events, but we have mobile units outside, you know, reaching people in the streets. Those are the types of projects that, you know, we would like to see prioritized simply because they shouldn't be complicated. They're a small dollar amount and they would have a tremendous impact. So, you know, I will be reaching out to you guys about my own local, but collectively just uh, as a council, I would ask for consideration of looking at a lot of these projects in terms of the magnitude, the scope, the size, uh, and where you can expedite. You know, certainly we would love to see that because a lot of these projects really, really do make a, a real difference in our communities, especially in light of, of COVID. All right, thank you so much. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Chair Rosenthal. Appreciate your time today. And congratulations. Thank you. Um, you know, actually to follow up on your question, uh, uh, Councilwoman Gibson, um, would DDC be willing to have a small working group, tiny, working group to look at projects, uh, the council member discretionary projects, and maybe, you know, just sort of work with you on priorities. Um, you know, given given the timeline that that we're some of us are under. Um, yeah, I, I mean, I, I'd say we're happy to do whatever is useful. I do know that we um, we are very engaged with council finance on yep. the discretionary program. So, and I, I'm, I, I would have to check, or maybe Rachel knows. I think we, we already have a, a group that meets maybe monthly. Um, so maybe we just pull that all together to make sure that we're, we're, uh, we're tracking everything. But yeah, happy to whatever's useful. Great, busted. I haven't asked the staff that question myself. So great to know, and I'm sure you guys are already on top of it. But thank you. So I have two last questions that I just want to get the answers on the record. Um, so here they go. DDC's recent capital workflow represents a small portion of the capital program that your client agencies have pursued in the, in the past years. Um, since you weren't able to complete all the projects that were on tap for last year and new projects added for fiscal year 21 adoption and throughout this year so far, what kind of back project backlog is the agency facing? Um, and secondly, as DDC returns to its normal level of ongoing capital projects in its portfolio, what assistance or guidance is the administration giving to help some of the backlog? And that could include, um, you know, perhaps uh, not subjecting this uh, part of the agency as much to the freeze, the hiring freeze. Um, I think, Rachel, do you want to comment on the status of our commitment plan? Yeah, sure. Um, so, I mean, as you probably know from, and I guess will be a hearing um, in a few weeks about the budget, but, you know, last year's commitment plan was uh, just over $2 billion for DDC. Um, the current uh, commitment plan for this fiscal year is now 2.7 billion, right? So that, that has increased um, because a lot of projects that couldn't complete um, or we couldn't register them um, at the end of last fiscal year, rolled into this year. So right now we are seeing a larger commitment plan. Um, next year is, is comparably large. Uh, you know, we're, we're going into obviously the next budget cycle where we're starting to look at what actually can be committed this fiscal year um, and maybe pushing some things out. And, you know, this is where we work really closely with our sponsor agencies to, to really analyze what can be done by fiscal year. Um, I think uh, 
uh, Chair Rosenthal, you mentioned at the beginning kind of the assembly line uh, that Lucy and Ethel um, image. And um, I think that's very appropriate. I mean, it is very much how we think about it and, and having kind of that um, halted, you know, um, and now that we're getting back on track, you know, it's a slow, it's going to be a slow ramp up um, and we're not going to be able to catch up. You know, there was a period of time we lost um, and, you know, we're not going to be able to do, do double the workload in the next six months, but, um, but we are ramping back up. We're doing it slowly and in consultation, you know, with the priorities um, of the administration and, um, you know, we're ready to go. I mean, bids, bids are opening now. Uh, RFPs are going out, CPs are, are being processed, and, and we're kind of getting back on that assembly line. Yeah, great. Thank you. Um, you could even, I was just trying to think uh, over the course of a, a year, a fiscal year, whatever, you could see um, um, your workload and that, you know, to the extent that fiscal year 19 was sort of the... Um, a usual year, and you could compare that to, to 20 and then 21, you might see a different workflow. Um, you know, in 20, it being more back end, and maybe 21 starting at a, a higher level, maybe. Does that make sense? Yeah, one of the things um, we, we were actually talking about is that one of the things that usually happens and if you follow kind of commitments throughout the year is there's a big surge, you know, at the last quarter of the year is when the majority of commitments are made. Um, but because we're kind of starting now, kind of restarting now, we actually um, anticipate that it's going to be a little flatter next year, that we'll be able to have a lot more registrations in the first half of the year than might be a typical year. Um, so it'll be more sustained, consistent workflow instead of a, a kind of up and down. Yeah, yeah, great. Thank you very much. It helped explain it. Um, secondly, uh, the council is aware of a letter sent to the DDC design contractors from March 26, 2020, understandably directing them to immediately halt all services under their contracts with DDC. And of a letter written to the mayor <laughs> by several industry groups protesting the work stoppage. Besides that letter, what did the DDC communicate with its designers and vendor contractors about the slowdown? And how often was that back and forth? Um, sure. Um, I, I would say, I mean, we're we're in continuous contact with our vendors, our, our design and engineering consultants and our contractors. So, and we certainly in this very difficult time of unfortunately having to, to stop a lot of this work, we were in, in regular contact with them. Um, we updated our website on a regular basis. Um, we have a very good interactive relationship with industry associations again, both on the contracting side and on the architecture and engineering side. And so we're, you know, we did many, many Zoom, uh, Zoom meetings with them um, and, and just tried to keep everyone apprised of what was happening. Okay, well, thank you for that. I hope you'll stay on. This wraps up my set of questions um, with the administration, but I hope you'll stay on because I think we're gonna hear next from some of those industry representatives. And you know, will be it'll be interesting to hear their perspective on it. Um, so, to the extent that you can leave staff here and then get some feedback, and maybe we can send you their testimony that they've submitted, so you can see what's going on from their perspective. That would be very much appreciated. Thank you very much. Thank you for the the opportunity to uh, testify today. And and yes, we're certainly. Uh, be someone here and we're, we're paying close attention to the hearing. Great. Thank you so much for coming Thank here. You, today. Really look forward to working with you. I'm going to send it back now to the committee council, Noah Breck. Thank you. We will now turn to te testimony from members of the public who signed up in advance to testify. I'd like to remind everyone that unlike our in-person council hearings, we will be calling individuals one by one to testify. Once your name is called, a member of our staff will unmute you and the Sergeant at Arms will set the timer and announce that you may begin. Your testimony will be limited to three 
minutes. I would now like to welcome Adam Roberts to testify, followed by Bill Murray. Thank you, Chair Good Rosenthal time. and members of the committee for holding this hearing today. I'm Adam Roberts, the Director of Policy for the American Institute of Architects New York, also known as AIA New York. We are the professional association representing New York's public and private sector architects. The design work stoppage at DDC and other agencies has been devastating to our city. Without design, construction cannot move forward. As such, the openings of countless schools, libraries, parks, and other essential projects have already been delayed by a full year. Vulnerable New Yorkers who rely most heavily on our public buildings will be hurt the most by this ongoing delay. The design work stoppage has also reduced the incomes of tens of thousands of architects, engineers, contractors, and tradespeople. For these reasons, labor and industry groups sent a letter to the mayor at the beginning of the pandemic asking that the work stoppage end, and we have yet to receive a reply. The design work stoppage imperils DDC's ability to carry out very time sensitive projects. One of these is the implementation of design build, a project delivery method by which architects and contractors work simultaneously on design and construction. Last year, the city secured design build authority from New York State. DDC is implementing design build, but the lack of funding for its capital program has meant that essentially one staffer is overseeing this rollout. If the city is restarting these design build projects, then DDC must be sufficiently funded to oversee them. The design work stoppage at DDC also hampers the city's ability to comply with Local Law 97 of 2019, also known as the Climate Mobilization Act. Buildings, including those owned by the city, must be in complying in only a few years. With such a tight deadline to retrofit potentially hundreds of public buildings, the city must allow DDC to begin this work immediately. It will be very problematic if the city failed to comply with its own landmark legislation. During this budget season, we hope council members will fight for the capital program at DDC and other agencies to be fully funded. We recognize that in a fiscal crisis, everyone is urging that their industries be fully funded. Yet the repercussions of not funding the city's capital program will reverberate throughout all sectors of our economy. It goes against good fiscal practice, which is to build more during an economic crisis in order to jumpstart the economy. Again, thank you for holding this hearing and inviting us to testify today. Uh, Chair Rosenthal, do you have any questions for uh, Mr. Roberts? May I ask you, Council, um, how many people will be testifying? We currently have five registered to testify who are in the Zoom with us now. If people wouldn't mind staying on, uh, I'd like to ask questions that probably will be for everyone. Um, so, so I'd like to keep my questions to the end. I'm really listening to everyone's testimony. Thank you. Okay, on that basis, can we hear next from Bill Murray, followed by Lisa Alpert. Your time will begin now. Okay, good morning, Chair Rosenthal and members of the subcommittee. My name is Bill Murray. I am the New York City Director of Government Relations for the American Council of Engineering Companies of New York, or ACEC New York for short. We are an association representing uh, approximately or, or nearly 300 consulting engineering and affiliate companies with um, about 30,000 employees in New York State and a concentrated presence in New York City. Just to give you a sense, about 53% of our, our membership um, lies in New York City. About 50% of our firms are small, meaning one to 35 uh, persons in count, 40% medium and 10% large firms. Um, what our members do is plan and design the structural, electrical, mechanical, plumbing, civil, environmental, fire protection, and technology uh, systems for both vertical, meaning sort of building infrastructure in the city, as well as horizontal, um, water, transportation, and so forth. Um, we are thankful for this hearing today. We're also thankful for your leadership, um, our leaders in government throughout the pandemic. We know it's been challenging to balance um, the public health crisis and the, and the fiscal fallout um, that has resulted. The pandemic's impact on the city's capital program has been particularly challenging for our industry, um, which which has included the city's pause on capital program design projects by agencies, including but not limited to the DDC, the SEA, the DOT, and the EDC. These impacts have created challenges for middle-class New York families who work in and are employed by our industry. 
This includes many thousands of engineers, construction managers, subcontractors, NWBE firms, um, which is about 28% of our, our um, membership and small businesses, all of whom we represent. Our members have been doing their best to stay in business over the last 11 months to mitigate layoffs, furloughs, substantial pay cuts and benefit cuts. But unfortunately, some of these impacts have been a reality um, for, for many, if not most of our members over the, over the recent months. While our organization is marshalling resources to advocate um, for federal support to the city government, we cannot rely solely on Washington DC to provide um, our city with an economic recovery. Um, design work is an essential core component to economic recovery. It's linked to the economic well-being of countless New York families, including not only the architects um, we just heard from Adam and the engineers, which I am speaking for, but also for general contractors, construction workers, and ancillary industries whose, whose livelihoods are also dependent on the design and construction sector. Um, we therefore urge you know, that widely across all of the city agencies, design work be resumed and in a robust way. The city needs to be ready to move forward into construction once the COVID emergency has subsided. Um, history has shown infrastructure spending in particular has multiplier effects for the economy. In the short term, it results in good paying local jobs, fighting, fighting wider uh, economic activity. Yes. Feel free to finish, Bill, thank you. Okay, thank you, Chair. In the long term, investment in infrastructure boosts economic health by increasing our economy's supply capacity. For example, improving the transportation system makes workers more mobile, um, makes labor markets more efficient and more productive. In conclusion, the capital program is not only at the heart of our city's economy, uh, but it is crucial to maintaining our status as a global leader. By investing in capital projects, both design and construction, New York can lead the way out of this difficult time and develop the necessary transportation, environmental, energy, resilience, and business infrastructure that will keep us moving forward. Um, I thank you again for, for your leadership on this issue and for the time to speak. Thank you. Okay. Um, one second. Um, Looking my script. Okay. Uh, can we next hear from Lisa Alpert, followed by Glenn Belofsky? Your time will begin now. Yeah. Hi. Good morning, Chairperson Rosenthal, members of the council. My name is Lisa Alpert. I'm the Vice President of Development and Programming at Greenwood Cemetery in Brooklyn. Um, feel pretty confident that the capital project I'm gonna talk briefly about, um, which is well underway, is unlike any other project you'll hear about this morning. It's an education and welcome center for a cemetery. And I'm just here today to underscore the importance of continued capital investment to keep our project and so many others moving forward. Um, at Greenwood, our education and welcome center will be directly across the street from our main entrance combines the restoration of a landmarked greenhouse with new construction, and it will allow us to greatly expand the number of people we serve by giving us critical indoor space. This project is already underway. The greenhouse restoration is almost complete, and the new construction, as everyone likes to hear, is shovel ready. Um, just very, very quickly, I want to give you some important context for what we do here at Greenwood and why this building is so critical to our South Brooklyn community. Um, yes, we are still an active cemetery, but our 501c3 organization in normal years, pre-COVID, uh, presents over 250 public programs, tours, and events every year. And in addition, about 300,000 people were coming to Greenwood annually to stro stroll our beautiful grounds. But last year, 2020, and extra many <laughs> extraordinary things happened. One in particular was that when the pandemic hit, we made the decision to open all four of our gates at Greenwood and staff them until 7 p.m. every night, seven days a week. And what happened? 600,000 people came to Greenwood to take a walk through our grounds, literally double the number of the previous year. Um, I just wanna tell you really briefly about the kinds of programming that we offer, really briefly. Um, we do workforce development programming at Greenwood. We train young people um, from low-income communities in masonry restoration and historic preservation. We have a major program with Cornell University called the Urban Grasslands Institute on climate change and urban green spaces. 
We give tours to over 3,500 school students a year, and we host innovative arts and cultural programs on our grounds throughout the year. This capital project is a critical component to allow us to serve even more New Yorkers. And just in conclusion, put very simply, we're a huge outdoor space, but we also need indoor space for school groups and trainings and workshops, and we need a place to offer first class visitor orientation and visitor services. We have 60% of our funding in hand. The detailed architectural and engineering plans are complete and ready to go. We are shovel ready. Did I say that already? Um, and it will help bring more tourists and thus help accelerate the economic recovery of South Brooklyn. Um, we're really eager to build this structure and to serve our own community and beyond. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, can we next hear from Glenn Bolofsky, followed by William Gaddy? Your time will begin now. Thank you for your help there on muting. Uh, good morning, uh, Chair Rosenthal and uh, council members and central staff. Uh, thank everyone uh, for their help here this morning and congratulations on the debut hearing this morning, uh, Chair Rosenthal. It's going very well. Uh, and I'm very appreciative of uh, participating this morning. As a CPA, my background is balance sheets and financial reporting. I work for Carnegie Hall and uh, many other companies, both in the public and private sector. And um, I appreciate the financial challenges that DDC uh, struggles with. And I greatly appreciate the points that uh, Adam Roberts and Bill Murray made this morning uh, about their industries as well and Greenwood Cemetery. It all comes down to uh, available funds, available cash and available uh, uh, time to analyze how much cash there is at hand at any given time. So, you know, that, that's really my focus uh, and, and the next opportunity uh, that there uh, presents itself, love to find out from DDC what their burdens are in terms of, uh, and you were asking about this, uh, Chair Rosenthal, their top 10 list, their top 20 list, and uh, Councilman uh, Lander and, and, and Barry also, uh, Grodencheck, I asked about this um, as well as Count Councilwoman uh, Vanessa Gibson asked about this. Um, the clarification is needed as to the top 10, the top 20, what financial shortfalls there are at the immediate moment. And that's the testimony I have this morning. Thank you very much. Uh, at this time, there appear to, we appear to have called on all members of the public who are logged onto the Zoom. I've just, uh, as for our last call, please raise your hand if you are in the Zoom and have not been called upon. Seeing no hands raised, uh, Council uh, Chair Rosenthal, I'll turn it back to you. Great, thank you so much. I have three questions. Um, two are for everyone. Uh, so this is for primarily for Adam and Bill. What do you think the city could have done differently? to alleviate the challenges and the confusion during the emergency orders that were put out during the pandemic? There, there, I think there's a lot they could have done differently. I think our members would have liked a little notice as far as those members who are consulting with DDC and also those who work in DDC. Uh, you know, we understand that this was a crisis that just unfolded over the course of only a few weeks. Um, but still, the, pretty much uh, people received a letter <laughs> one day and, and that was it, they were done working. Uh, so in you know a future crisis of this sort, which hopefully we don't have one like this again, that there at least be a few days, if not a few weeks notice uh, that design work will be stopping. Um, I, I'd chime in as well and just say, you know, I, I um, agree with the sentiments. I think transparency and communication is is so crucial. Um, and I, but I do want to publicly say thank you to to Jamie Springer Torres, to Andrew, to DDC, also to you know my counterparts at the EDC, at the DOT. I, I really feel 
agency staff has been, you know, has been in a similar boat to 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 ACEC New York um, and to the firms we represent in doing our best to you know learn information um, about the decisions at OMB. Um, and, and, you know, we have had regular meetings with our counterparts at the DDC, at, at, at um, sister agencies. And um, to the extent information um, was, was able to be shared, it was. And that continues through, through today. You know, we have regular meetings with our, our um, contacts in those places. But I would say, you know, from the top, we have tried to engage City Hall, um, including in that, in that uh, letter chair that you referred to. Mm -hmm. And so, um, I say that, but also I'm, I'm aware on the other hand, this was a crisis, right? The public health crisis, revenues went down as a result, um, COVID related expenses went up. And so we trust, you know, good decisions were made at, at that OMB level, but um, didn't have a, a ton of insight into, into that. Um, and really going forward, I just hope that we can be a voice of, hey, we may not be the most vocal sector out there, but, but we are a whole industry. There's a whole ecosystem and the capital program really is fundamental to the city's economy. So, so we hope that sort of going forward, um, you know, as as the situation improves, um, you know, you you can you can consider that in your leadership on 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 the capital program. Yeah, thank you. I'm wondering, as a follow up, did the companies that you represent have to? I imagine they had to lay off workers or apply for PPP? Like, how did it play out? I could, I could start on that one if, um, if it's okay. Um, so it really, you know, I spoke with some of our members the last couple of days. It really, um, every situ situation is unique. Um, some of the things that, that affect a, a, um, the circumstance of an individual firm are its size. So ones that are smaller um, had the PPP available to them, mm. um, which, which was a great go government policy and program. There have been some issues about it um, still to this day in terms of forgiveness and, and all of these things. But um, um, then there are firms that were not, did not have access to PPP. So that is one factor. Another one is the firm's portfolio. If it is a public clientele, including mayoral agencies, um, they were more, more vulnerable to, to the design pause. If they were private um, uh, clientele, like, like buildings, um, you know, it's a different, different story. But by and large, you know, the, the impacts that we have, um, have, have borne have been furloughs, pay cuts, and that is, you know, small to all the way up to the largest of firms. And just that's been the reality, furloughs, pay cuts. In some cases, um, you know, people letting being let go, um, but um, so so that's what I would say on that. You know, f speaking with an executive yesterday, it is a last resort to let someone go. There is um, there is a scarcity of design professionals in New York and in the whole country, really. And so, when you have a quality person that you've invested in, because it's a licensed profession, um, this person has education credits. Um, you, you know, they gain experience in, in the New York City market, you really are loath, loath to let them go. So it's really been a last resort. Yeah, you know, um, I've spoken with a few architects who said that their work just shifted uh, to designing, um, you know, medical centers or, or work stations um, and that a lot of the private companies built like, um, you know, like an energy center, like a medical workstation in the lobbies of their buildings so that she, she felt anyway that work continued. It was a different type of work. Unfortunately, that's not really the experience I've heard from most of our members. Uh, this is incredibly devastating for our members, as Bill said, from the smallest firms to the largest firms. City work is already something which few architects uh, make a profit on, or few architecture firms make a profit on. It's usually done for the public good uh, or to showcase to private sector clients. And so these were already projects where people weren't making money and then now they're starting to dramatically lose you know, millions of dollars. And so unfortunately there were a lot of layoffs. 
um, that have really devastated uh, our industry. And you know, we we hope that these jobs are, are filled in the future because the last thing we want is for people to go move to other cities uh, where you know their their city governments are more supportive of public works. You know, yes. I, oh, sorry. No, I just wanted to agree with that last point that out of me. That's so true. I mean, there really is a scarcity of design professionals and, and we need to keep New York a home for them. Um. Yeah. Adam, if I could just follow up with you, you mentioned that the work stoppage um, could have an impact on helping the city comply with the requirements of the Climate Mobilization Act for its own buildings. Can you give us a few examples of that? I, I don't know specific buildings, um, but it's widely believed that by at least the members I talked to who work for the city that, that hundreds of city buildings will need to be retrofitted and compliance is starting in uh, only a few years for those worst performing buildings. So uh, design and construction can take, I was actually just looking today at the Center for Urban Future, their report from a few years ago said the average city building takes four years from uh, start to completion, though many, I think a third they said go past seven years. So if the city is looking for its worst performing buildings to comply, they should have started designing them last year. Um, and they, they haven't because there's been so far at least a year of, of work stop. Right, I'd like to actually follow up with you on that offline, you know, maybe if we could, uh, you know, sort of be a little more focused on that from your members and hear more stories, I'd be really interested in following up on that one specifically. My last question for everyone is for the projects that you did continue to work on, were there any processes or procedures that were lifted during the pandemic that you would like to see continued or that you thought were not good things that those you know processes, whether it be local law 63, whatever, um, that you would not like to see that go forward? The, I think the most important was, um, and I, I alluded this in our testimony, was the institution of design build, not so much because of design build as a project delivery system, but because the state in allowing design build allowed the city for the first time to procure contractors with best value procurement, which means the city does not have to go with the cheapest contractor, which for many reasons is just an absolutely terrible idea and is also one of the main reasons MWBEs don't work with the city. Um, so that is something which going forward would require state approval and uh, hopefully does happen because it would save the city countless dollars and is long for many decades been known to be a huge problem with contracting with the city. Um, so we hope that is something that is continued. I would say, um, Chair, one, one um, change that has occurred, which has been actually good, a silver lining, has been uh, the increasing reliance on, on um, the agencies on um, electronic processes for, you know, as opposed to old, um, older, more cumbersome processes, you know, sort of fortunately and coincidentally, the, the city has been rolling out this passport system, um, which we are terrifically optimistic about. The, the biggest challenge for firms, uh, you know, from smallest to, to the largest in, in serving the city um, clients is the paperwork, the, um, the contract registration process, the, the payment process, you know, it's essentially floating the city alone in, in some cases. When, when you do work and you pay someone to do work and then takes, you know, months to, to receive payment, um, that's a real challenge. And so we're hopeful that all this movement to electronic processes can, can improve that. Um, so that's been, you know, some, I think it's accelerated that process. Um, and we hope that that good work continues. Um, I'm very familiar with Passport, having been the chair of the Committee on Contracts for my first term. So uh, mainly, I know the rollout initially focused on the health and human services sector, but seeing now it come to the, you know, general um, contractor side of the ledger is, is really great to hear about it. I'd love to hear more about that and where there are hiccups even in that, like 
as they roll it out to your sector? Are you able to use, you know, the vaults and are they rolling it out with the invoicing um, abilities that they are now starting to use on the social services side? It'd be great to hear more. Maybe we'll set up a meeting offline about that, but that's terrific to hear. All right, with that, uh, should I turn it back to you, uh, Noah? Uh, there's nothing further at this time. I think you can just thank everyone and gavel out. I would like to thank everyone for uh, coming today. And again, thank the staff very, very much. And um, I'm gonna gavel out now. Thank you.